Gareth Jones on speed. News flat. The UK government has ended the grant scheme by which buyers of new electric vehicles were given a rebate of £1,500. This action has been criticised by motoring and car industry groups as sending out the wrong message. When asked what the correct message should be, a spokesman for a trade organisation said that the right thing for the government to do right now would be to immediately reinstate the grant for purchases of all new electric vehicles and also to offer motorists a £3,000 payout to help them cover the increase in petrol and diesel prices largely due to the UK government's utter inability to manage this situation better. We here at Gareth Jones on Speed couldn't agree more, as this government could manage a rollover crash fest and a reliant robbing convention. Hello, welcome to Gareth Jones on Speed. I'm Gareth Jones. He's Alex Goy. Hi. He went to Le Mans and I watched it at home. (laughs) So this episode is going to be Alex Goy and Gareth Jones sharing our Le Mans experiences, amongst other things later on. But I've got to talk to you, Alex. I wasn't able to go this year. You were. How was it for you? How did you get there? Where were you staying? What were you driving? Flying? Everything. Tell me. I need to know I wasn't there. <laughs> well, this being the year of our Lord 2022, I believe, Gareth, it is 10 years since I met you. Because I get think out. it was Le Mans 2012. Oh. If that's when the Toyota GT86 was launched, which I will now hurriedly check. I should have checked it before. That was your first year. It was at my Le Mans. first Le Mans, and it was all terribly exciting. Oh, Come on, Wikipedia, it's help still me still terribly out here. exciting. I love meeting people. Like Look, I got to meet Gareth Jones off the telly. Well, the famous farmer, Gareth Wynne Jones. That yeah, one. Yes, that there guy. There are lots of Gareth Joneses. He's far more famous than this one. Well, not in my house. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, where are we? Oh, 2013. So it was nine years. 2013. Nine years. So we haven't got oh, our no, no, 10 no, no, year no, friend no, no, no. Uh, Europe 2012. Yeah. So it's a model, oh, year, model year 13, launched in 12. Hey. So yes, it is 10 whole years. That's a decade. That's. That's a very by. long time. <laughs> outrageous. One quick question before we go any further. You're going to be there next year for the centenary of the initial coupe de whatever it was called at the beginning of the Le Mans 24. You're going to be there next year? If I can wangle a way to get there with minimal effort, then yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what was the effort like this year? How did you get there? Being the typical freeloading journalist I am, I went out with and manufacturer with Alpine. Fair play. Who yeah. were invited they had a sort of monolith hospitality thing at the end of the pit lane with a lovely roof terrace so I watched the start from the very end of the pit lane and when that big helicopter goes over it was basically at eye level which was terrifying and excellent in equal measure correct I should actually say that helicopter you're talking about is the military helicopter that delivers the, the chicken flag. Or- Yes. And then does this sort of dive towards the surface of the start finish straight and flies at eye level along what appears like eye level along the start finish straight. It's breathtaking. There is a picture of it on my Twitter somewhere and it was very much at eye level from where I was. was We were watching at home here, Tycho and a couple of Tycho's pals. And I said, you've got to watch this because I know what they do every year. Yeah. And they weren't expecting it. And they literally stood up off their sofas when they saw this thing seemingly death plunging towards the surface it's a, such a piece of drama i love the opening i get emotional at the start of the le mans 24 hours it was ace especially because this time it's it's the first time since the before times that yeah everyone's been allowed back and you did what you're supposed to do you drove there at a mark which has a history at racing at le mans good old rp drove out in a bunch of a110s which was hilarious fun because i've not actually spent any meaningful time in them before I filled half my frunk with wine on the way there, so that's now in my fridge. <laughs> There's also a cornichon and a kilo of Nutella. Anyway. You've been to French land, hooray. Oh, yes. I drove out in Alpine, went to watch their definitely not LMP1 car compete in the hypercars category against Toyota <laughs> and Mr. Glickenhaus, the man in the big hat. And it was utterly fantastic. I mean, it was, it was someone noted on Twitter that it was a bit quieter than usual this yep, year. Yep. And I won't say the race was a classic of the genre. Yeah, yeah. Let's be honest, Glickenhaus is still finding its feet. Yeah. So the car did well, but not as well as, say, 
the car that's basically had free run for five years. I mean, I'm glad Toyota's won a few now, yeah. but it has been in a category of really just Toyota. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, this is how I saw Le Mans this year. That You know, when you're kids and you're in primary school, mm. everybody gets to win. Yeah. And if you, if you look at the upper category at the moment, right, Toyota are the only car in the hypercar hybrid category, subcategory, right? Yeah. So they're going to win. Well done, Toyota. It was theirs to lose. Yeah. Quite spectacular. Having said that, Glickenhaus are the only manufacturers running cars in the hybrid class, non-hybrid category. So... They were winners, in my heart, anyway. They were winners. They did very well. It was quite sad to be in my big ivory Alpine tower. Basically, they were throwing money at the thing, going like, Alpine's great. Come and watch our car do really well, because they're doing quite well in the WEC at the moment, aren't yeah, they? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we watched the Alpine go further and further down and get monstered by almost every LMP2 car. You know, the boys were trying very hard. And they were very lovely chaps as well. But they'd lost 18 laps or something in the pits. More than that, I think. They got a bunch yeah. of laps back, I think. But they had transmission issues, didn't they? They were in the garage forever. They had many issues. Mm. They, they had a crash as well, which didn't help. Someone knocked the front off it, or a big chunk off the front. And uh, yeah, so seeing the guys at the start of the race being all very excited and then just the faces getting more and more crestfallen mm. as time went on. It was just oh, a bit... Yeah. A bit rough, but it was genuinely ace to be there. There are a few things. It's not as noisy as it used to be, and this isn't an... Oh, I'm, uh, I mean, the, the cars aren't as noisy, so the Ferraris don't hurt my ears anymore, but the Corvettes aren't dirty. They're not dirty anymore. They're not dirty noises, because oh. previously it was that proper low, rumbly... Brown! Yeah, it used to say. That's the one. Yeah. That's the one, just like the motorbikes just come past my house. <laughs> um, um, but... Now, now they sort of sound like normal cars. They sort of blend in with the Ferraris and the Astons. I was wondering about that because I don't know, but I'm guessing the motor in that Corvette is the same one that was in the, what was it called? The C06 previously, R5, the last of the front engine vehicles. No, because they built a new one. Did they? For the new new Corvette. Yeah, because it's a whole new car, whole new everything. So I think that the engine that's in, I think I'm fully prepared for someone to tell me I'm wrong. Mm. or in fact I go to the internet but I will prophesize in the meanwhile well my theory on this was that if it was the same engine with a front engine installation you could have a really nice long resonant pipe as your exhaust efflux however with a mid-engine installation of a motor you've still got to have your tuned pipes but you can't have them straight they've got to be all wiggly woggly haven't they you are entirely right the road legal car is the 6.2 litre that out of the LT1. So yes, and the C8R makes 500 horsepower from a five and a half litre V8. Overhead cams, LT2. So no, no, all lies. <laughs> Nothing to do with the road car. Sod that noise. <laughs> hey, we'll do deep dive, as they say on that, uh, when we're not <laughs> on air. But yeah, I miss being at Le Mans. I miss the sound of the Corvettes, who are always the bass mm. baritone of the orchestra. Yeah. And they then for them to have such a disastrous race, having looked so quick in oh, qualifying. Oh, was so good. They were doing so well. And then I was walking through the paddock and I heard this French man over the tannoy, very, very upset and not quite knowing why until I got back to a screen and a Twitter. And, oh, yeah, apparently the Corvette's no more. A friend of mine was going off to interview them about something. And then he was, oh, I'm going to go off to my interview. They've just crashed. So pff, who knows what? Uh Those poor Corvettes. You mentioned James Glickenhaus. I was following certain teams, and despite having owned a Toyota myself for 20 years, my Sora, which I don't own anymore, as you know, I found it very hard to support the Toyota team because they were on their own. I wanted the Alpine, I wanted one of the Glickenhauses to Mm. take the race to them, if not beat them. I know it was a big ask, but you can always hope. You know, Le Mans can be cruel. You can always hope. And moreover, Nicolas Lapierre was driving the Alpine, Mm. and uh, he's an old pal of mine from the A1 Grand Prix years, so I have a sort of personal interest in this as well. But Jim Glickenhaus, have you ever heard Jim Glickenhaus being interviewed in his hat on TV? I've interviewed him. Get out! Years and years and years ago at the Geneva Motor Show. Shut the flipping door! It was during SC004, they unveiled that and the 007 at Geneva, 
I think. This was like a thousand years ago now. And it was when Lamborghini had done a lap of the Nürburgring in the Huracan Evo, I think, and tried to claim some sort of record. Right. I just happened to be next to him with my phone in my hand and said, hello, I'm a journalist, care to answer this controversy? And he was very, very straightforward. He basically went, yeah, it's bullshit. (laughs) bless him. Yeah, so I have met the great man. Yeah. He was behatted. I like everything about his manner. I don't know his film, Zognos. We had this conversation briefly on the It's Tromaville, isn't it? I've no idea. It's it's B-movie stuff. Right, fine. Uh, Well, whatever his background, you know, (laughs) even if he was a pornographer. No, that's wrong. No, the fact that he's come into motorsport with his passion for extraordinary road cars and has accepted this incredible challenge... Mm. He's kind of done it in an almost American 1960s way. There's something very Ford versus Ferrari about him in his big hat, isn't there? Yeah. But there are two things about Glickenhaus I really admire. The first is that the car, the 007, I think they call it, the front end of it, it evokes a Porsche 917K. Crossed with a chisel. Correct. It will definitely... It, it slices goes its down. way along. Yes, it does. Yeah, yeah. It dips. Yeah. And it's in some way it's got quite crude aero compared to everything else, including the LMP2 cars at the front end, from what mm. I can tell. The rear end, I could see the whole diffuser is proper complex. But I like that sort of purity. It looks like it could possibly have been designed in the 70s or the 80s, this car. Yeah. You know, part of the Le Mans heritage. So I admire that. But the thing I like most about James Glickenhaus is I don't know if you've ever listened to how he speaks, but I'm pretty convinced that whoever does his voice for him is probably John Malkovich, you know. <laughs> Malkovich, Malkovich, Malkovich. It's got to be John Malkovich. It's got to be. He sounds just like him. Everything is very measured. and You can hear the bit of the New York there. You're not wrong, actually, yeah. You're not wrong. He just strikes me that he's, he's a man who went, I like cars, I like racing, I want to make my own race team. I have more money than God. I want half that much money again so let's make a race team yeah, 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 yeah. i do wonder whether his participation in motorsports is driven in no small part because of ferrari being mean to him once oh i don't know this story you remember that p45 thing that he he was he, building one wasn't he, he built his own yeah. that's the most incredible car and i think that i think there were some legal wranglings or something like that uh, words were had and so glickenhaus <laughs> might be like all right Ford did you once I'll do you oh, again. Bless you. Bless you. What a lovely way of making a point. Well done. True sport. Uh, the noble is a noble man. Isn't it? No, no, yeah. no, noble profession, noble profession. There was lots of stuff to talk about at Le Mans this year in terms of celebrity. You know, we flirted with the movies with Mr. Glickenhouse, but Michael Fassbender, star of the Alien Prometheus subcategory of films. And let us not forget Magneto in at least one good X Men movie. Oh, of course he was. I'd quite forgotten that. I can't see him as anyone other than Lawrence of Arabia, or Peter O'Toole's version of T.S. Lawrence, who was a Welshman, actually. T.S. Lawrence, not Peter O'Toole, obviously. (laughs) And as far as I can tell, there were no Welsh people or Welsh-connected people racing at Le Mans this year, apart from one driver who is called William Owen. William Owen. Yeah, but I think he was from Colorado, <laughs> so um, I don't know. William Owen. Colorado, that's in Glamorgan, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's right next to Cardiff. <laughs> that's right. I was back in the Irish connection with Michael Fassbender in a green. A very lovely green Porsche oh. that passed me more than once. <laughs> it, yeah, he did really well. They were running at the end. I made notes. Oh, yeah? How do you do? Because as we were discussing before this went on, even though I was at the race, I have no idea what happened. Apart from Alpine losing quite spectacularly and Toyota winning because that was always going to happen, the worst place to actually learn what's going on at Le Mans is at Le Mans. Mans. (laughs) Absolutely. It is very difficult, despite the best efforts of John Heindorf on Radio Le Mans trying to keep you up to date. But I noticed John Heindorf stepped down from some of the key moments during the race commentary. I didn't catch him at the opening, but he certainly didn't do the end. 
did. Oh, did you not? And uh, that's amazingly generous of him, you know, to share that amongst the team because Heindorf's wonderful. But you're right, it is almost impossible. You've got to look it up. Who won, what happened, where? Couldn't keep up. So I, I now get why these people have massive headphones on and they're, yeah. they're glued to live timings. I walked past the place, like, why are you watching the race on your phone? You're at the race. And then as the time went on, I went, what's going on in the race? Yeah, yeah. No idea. Yeah. Went for a wander, went to see different corners and watched French people be incredibly drunk. Well, actually, British people be incredibly yeah. drunk. It is basically a big stag do. And, you know, had a bloody lovely time, but no clue what was going on, apart from cars going round in a wibbly circle. A wibbly circle. A good wibbly circle. I guess one thing that might be absent from Le Mans at the moment, because they didn't really deploy a safety car at any point did they it was all slow there was zones, one safety car because it passed me right okay on the sunday morning ish at right. about 11 o'clock midday what you used to get with the safety cars even when there were three safety cars with cars bunching up behind them so you, yeah. if you were in the middle of the night or you were at the stand you would get the snake going through mm. and that doesn't happen anymore they just elect it to be a slow zone and so they all parade by at the same sort of distance it's not quite the same level of drama is it at one point i did see a snake off cars cool behind a porsche good if i had my camera out it would have made for a brilliant picture yeah. sadly didn't because i was tired and hung over <laughs> That can happen. <laughs> it happens to the best of us. You see, you weren't camping this year. Where were you? No, because of my gilded tower, we were in a hotel in the middle of Le Mans. In town? Yeah, yeah we are right opposite the station, which was lovely. Uh, yeah. Right opposite the train. There was somewhere to park the car that was looked really unsafe. Cars were fine, no, my wine was safe. First things first. <laughs> and yeah, so we got a cab in and out on the first day and then drove in on the second day. It wasn't too bad, but it meant we could still follow the race, but not necessarily be woken up by loud cars and crashing. Mm-hmm. Which I'm not sure how I feel about, because I like the lack of sleep that sleeping at Le Mans gives you. Wow. It's been five years since I've been, so I'd sort of forgotten it. It was like going back to your primary school and going, wow, I remember that. I remember that. That's so cool. The life, the experience that the people give. Because while you can't follow the race while you're there, you can sort of get wrapped up in the other people. Yeah, exactly. And that's the bit that I really like, because I like people having fun and doing things. It's a social event, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. You can probably hear Finn the cat has joined in. Yeah, Finn. Hello, Finn. Finn, come here, stop shouting. Finn, come say hello. Finn, um, come on. There is one bit of devastating news I have for you, Gareth, and all the listeners of Gareth Jones on Speed. The Guinness tent is now a Carlsberg tent. Oh, outrage. Yeah. Outrage. Probably the filthiest p- in the oh. world. <laughs> <laughs> you can't say that on air. I guess I might bleep that. Yeah. As you know, my favourite pub is an Irish pub, my local pub here in Stoke Newington. And they pour the greatest glass of Guinness in the known universe, well, certainly outside of Ireland. And I often tell the story, if I'm there, of how I was served a Guinness in the Guinness tent at Le Mans. And the Guinness was served to me in less than, I'd say, 1.75 seconds. Poured, there it is, got it. (laughs) Yeah, that's not how you pour a Guinness. It could take anything up to 20 minutes if need be, you know. Yeah, if it needs to. So you get one, then when you've got that first one, you order the second. So it's ready for when you're finished with the first. Correct, that's how you do it. Now, yeah. at Le Mans, the Guinness was trash, but it didn't actually matter at that point because we were so happy to be socialising. The race has started. We we're all slightly more relieved and relaxed now that the race was underway. Let's go and have a drink. Mm-hmm. So I will miss that as the focal centre point. Carlsberg, I could probably drink that. I can still meet at the Carlsberg tent. I, mean, I didn't yeah. venture too close to it because it did look very busy and full of big boys. Yeah. And they were a bit scary. It's a football beer though, Carlsberg, isn't it? Yeah, well, I am a proponent of uh, you'll have to bleep this as well, of lagery disco. It's it's, it's my favourite drink. <laughs> I can enjoy a lager. Because it tastes watery, but a bit like beer and gets you a little bit squiffy. All the sort of mega hoppy yeah. oh, well, it's got notes of oak and strawberry. I just don't care yeah. that's for other people i get it but i don't care i want my beer to have a vague hint of beer about it yeah and carlsberg doesn't really have that <laughs> says i the least snobby beer snob in the world a man who drinks budweiser for fun on a hot day have a word with yourself Budweiser. it's good because it tastes a bit like beer and it doesn't get you that drunk so you can happily drink it for a day and it doesn't matter it's just water. Anyway, motor cars. Well, we're here. Yeah, <laughs> let me tell you about. Yeah, yeah. I, I thank you. It's terrible news that the Guinness tent is not the focal point. But I'll tell you what, next year, 
if it's called the Carlsberg Tent, we'll be there. Probably the best podcast in the world returning to Le Mans. Oh, yeah, it's happening. It's happening. That, that's happening. There, I just wanted to talk about some of the other notable stuff going on. We talked about lovely Mr. Fassbender, who I think did a fine job, bless him. Also, the awfully named Iron Dames. Yes, that was the team of Amazing Women Racers, right? Yeah, fantastic. Iron Lynx, bless them, ran a Ferrari 488 in the GTE AM class. And they had Rachel Frey, Michelle Gatting and Sarah Bovey driving. Three crack drivers. And mm. they not only finished 40th overall, but they finished 7th in class, which is rocking, isn't it? Rocking. Yeah, it's good, man. Also, who else did I pick out in the lower class? Uh, well, I got a win. You got a win? I got a win in GTE Pro. Unusually, I backed a Porsche this year. I back a bunch of cars for lots of personal reasons. But I backed the 91 Porsche because someone I've supported in motorsport for... I don't know, a quarter of a century, more, more, more. Gian Maria mm. Bruni was driving that car, and he was the winner in GTE Pro, and I'm so happy for him. Oh. A friend of mine, Lika, his dad managed him way back in, I, I honestly cannot remember, when he was a scruffy, miserable 19-year-old Italian lad in the cold and wet of Thruxton in Formula 3. It was <laughs> horrible for him, and I really felt for him. But he's been a GT racer, he's raced at Le Mans for years and years and years, as long as I've been going there, practically. And I'm so pleased that he got a win again this time round. That was fantastic. So I got that. Nowhere else did I do terribly well. But this year, it was all, actually, it was very much about LMP2 this year. You wouldn't be able to follow that at the race, but watching it on TV, the race in LMP2 was cracking really lmp2 is all same motor same chassis you can fiddle with limited things yeah yeah so it's essentially a really expensive citroen c1 race yeah that's fair comment yeah well <laughs> technically yeah there, there were i think four people licensed to build lmp2 chassis right orica riley ligier and someone else i can't remember there may have been five what happened was when this sort of franchise was allocated everyone grabbed a chassis went out racing and it turned out that the orica was by far the best chassis better than any of the others so they didn't sell any of us everyone bought oricas apart from ligier who insist on running their own chassis themselves of course i think how did they do official racing <laughs> that i think they did they finish? But they were the only non Orica chassis. Where did they finish? Look it up. I'm not even certain that they did finish. Uh, <laughs> I didn't make a note of that. Hang on. I'll to the internet. Yeah. To the yeah. internet. I'll race you. Here we go. Le Mans 2022. One handed typing. Okay. They were running at the end. Fair play. Good on them. They finished 49. 49? Yeah. Out of how many? 62 starters. 62. So actually, yeah. okay, they, yeah. they weren't beaten by too many GT cars. No. Did they beat the Alpine? <laughs> <laughs> Did they beat the Alpine? I'm looking. I'm looking. No, they didn't. Oh. No, they didn't. Sorry to report, they didn't know. The Alpine finished 33rd in the end. Oh, sorry, not 33rd. That's graph racing. Forgive me, I've made a terrible blunder. The Alpine finished 23rd. So, yeah, you're right. It wasn't a classic Le Mans. It wasn't. I remember a few years ago, there was that battle between the Vantage and the Corvette, which will forever, for me, be for like the, amazing. the Le Mans moment, down yeah. to the very nose. There was the Toyota dying just before the end of the race. Oh, you know, that incredibly drama. bad luck, but what a moment. And this year, Toyota won again. Yeah, yeah. Well, it well, was lovely to be there. I'm not, I'm not angry that I was there. Don't get me wrong, but it was, yeah. oh, sorry, it was a very sniff petrol. I was there, but you weren't, etc. <laughs> um, you know, it was a privilege to be there, but it wasn't one of those races where I was running to a screen or a corner to go, oh, they're going by. I can't yeah, wait to see yeah, this. Yeah. yeah, but fair play to Toyota for keeping the event going at the very, very highest level mm. when everyone else had dropped out. I'm not blaming them for staying in there. I'm blaming the ACO for not being able to truly put a package of absolutely representative competitors yeah. together for them. But, you know, that's up to the others to catch up and it's impossible to do unless you're one of the biggest car manufacturers on the planet so ford where were you ford ford when you came in and you had your amazing ford gt why couldn't you have hybrid the heck out of that and gone into hypercar well there was a ford gt mark ii released a few years ago was it goodwood 19 or the same year as the dita marso p72 it was a concept wasn't it 
Well, yes and no. It was an 800 horsepower Ford Multimatic thing. And basically, I remember it, it was like, if we were to do, say, a Le Mans hypercar, this would exactly fit those rules and regs, and then it vanished off the face of the earth. Oh, yeah, Ford, you let us down. What else did I observe? Oh, I actually gave someone a hint who likes a bit of betting, and he was trying to bet on it, and I said, oh, good bet of the TDS by Valiant team. Oh, yeah? Because they lost a driver during practice on Friday. He was told, no, I'm sorry, you are not good enough anymore to drive at Le Mans. You have done too many crashes. You are very, very bad at being a driving man. So he was bumped, and at the last minute, they pulled in Nick de Vries, who I'm a big fan of. He was fantastic in F2. And I was thrilled that Nick de Vries got a drive in a car, which, had, you know, started okay, but finished third in class overall. So if I'd have been a betting man, I would have made some money on that. Very unusual. You should have done next year. Put it all on. Yeah. My favourite team name at Le Mans, and you will have noticed this while you're there, Spirit of Race. Spirit of Race. Who calls their team Spirit of Race? It's the Spirit of the Race? or Well, apparently a Swiss team looking exactly. at the results. They... Correct. Spirit, Spirit of, of race. race. Spirit of it's Race. It's just so abstract. Spirit of Race. I love it. I love it. Well, I'll allow them that. Because the rest, like Iron Dames, strong name. I like that name. I think it's silly, Iron Dames. It's okay, but I think there could have been a better one. I know Riley Motorsports is, you know, because of American things, but it just makes me think of knackered old British cars. Yeah, it won't, it won't start. Try hitting it. It will start. Yeah, O'Reilly. Yeah, we had one of those. How many had first gear? You didn't have any other gears. Michigan don't make tyres for this anymore, so I made them myself yeah. on my shroud. <laughs> oh, dear me. Hey, OK, sum up the experience for me then. How was it? A little quiet, not a classic, but very, very, very good to be back. I think this year sets up next year really nicely. There's going to be so many more teams there at the very top level. It's going to be so very exciting. Be interesting to see how the two top flight classes contend with one another, how the ACO, how WEC is going to figure out. The balance of performance, yeah. Yeah, how the top spec is actually going to be allowed to be the top spec because the one below it will almost certainly be faster given the right chances. Yeah, it was good to be back. It was good to see a little bit of life there again rather than watching a sort of sterile race on the telly, hoping that something exciting's happening. Yeah, I've missed it immensely. I'm glad it's back properly. And next year will be, fingers crossed, really, really bloody good. Well... Next year, this is all I'm going to say at this point, I think there's going to be an official Gareth Jones on Speed trip, not just for us on the programme, but for a select number of listeners. If they want to come and join us at an incredible camp location, stay tuned. I would book your holidays now. I can't say anything more for the moment, but I'll leave you with that thought. Is Gareth Jones on Speed the Garage 56 entry? (laughs) <laughs> I like the way you think. <laughs> Do you remember the Arctic Monkeys? What sort of universe is this where we remember the Arctic Monkeys? Aren't they a new band or am I just getting old? I love the Arctic Monkeys, but Alex Turner from the Arctic Monkeys, I prefer his stuff with the Last Shadow Puppets. I love the Last Shadow Puppets so much that I've written a song and recorded it loosely in the style of the Last Shadow Puppets, doing Alex Turner's sort of club singer voice, which I rather enjoy. And as there hasn't been any Formula One in this episode so far, here's a song in the style of the Last Shadow Puppets, or in my case, the Lost Shady Puppets, that's about Formula One. Or is it? This is a racing out of space. Oh, I started to realize years ago there might be a gap in the market. 
an idea about racing cars I needed somewhere to park in We got races in Spain and Japan America and Vietnam So that's why I love this too About having a race on the moon But Bernie Ecclestone Wiles on Ginger your ideas clear, there's no atmosphere It hasn't even been tested There's no place for a flow When no man has gone before Tranquility base is no place for a race in outer space Tranquility base is no place for a race in outer space And may have left you a little bit sorrow But the lack of air on the lunar surface Ain't an insurmountable problem I know engines won't run in a vacuum So let's have racing without the room It's obvious to me electricity The solution is formula E Maybe Alexandra Electricity Don't need to breathe My idea could get arrested Yeah, there's no place for F1 Where no man has gone before But Tranquility Base is the perfect place For a race in outer space Yeah, Tranquility Base An electric race out there in outer space Gareth Jones on speed, freshly returned from a rapid, I hope, drive to Frenchland from England land in a mid-engine French sports car. Where? You went and came back in an Alpine A110, yes? I went there and back in an Alpine A110. Now, we had uh, on the trip, there were Alpine A110s of all varieties. So we had a pre-facelift one and we had an S, which is the quick one with the spoiler and the stiffer springs yep. and uh, stickier tyres and... Uh, a bit more power, the GT, which is a slightly softer one, again with the higher power output, and then the base one, which is the one I was in, with kind of no bells and no whistles and 250 or 260 horsepower. Yeah, plenty. Yeah, plenty, absolutely plenty. It was chuffing quick, that thing. It yeah. was great. It arrived at my house last Wednesday. It's being picked up the day after we record this, and I did roughly 1,100 miles in it all over the UK and into France. And do you have backache? I do don't but i don't like the bucket seats in it because you can't get comfortable in them uh -huh. they're seats where you sit really high in the car uh -huh. even though it's this small nimble light little thing 
because there's so much door and so much floor beneath your ass, or so much distance to the floor, I kept looking for a way to wrench the seat down, but yeah. I, I couldn't. Yeah. Which was incredibly annoying. Yeah, it's more of a sports car than a GT car, isn't it? Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. I also could have done with the upgraded sound system because the stereo... Like, it's a very first world problem. Yeah. But if you're going to be driving a thousand miles in something... Yeah, it's all going to work. It'd be nice to listen to a podcast. Oh, I can recommend one for you. <laughs> yeah, funnily enough, yes. I drove the A110 in... I have just looked it up. May 2019, I took it to the Welsh Alps, as we call them. The Welsh Alpine equivalent. Oh, lovely. And I absolutely adored it. I remember saying at the time that I felt it was a kind of a fusion of two concepts in a way. That I'd driven a Megan 260 or 360, I can't remember. Yeah. And a few years previous, and I remember thinking, wow, what a fantastic engine. And wow, what a wonderful, supple, compliant suspension on a sports car. Like this is Lotus territory. Imagine if they built a mid-engine version of this and the bang, of course, they did. <laughs> the Alpine came out, you know. Yeah. And it is, in some ways, what Lotus do exactly. You know, a cheap, lightweight, yeah. sporting mid-engine car. Cheap is a relative term. Yeah, the one I'm in, the base one with very few toys, apart from one, the option of a blue A logo Alpine thing in the middle of the steering wheel is 78 quid, <laughs> which I think is a bit much. Yeah, that's still £51,000, sir. Oh, it's a lot of money, isn't that's it? That's not yeah. cheap. Yeah. I'm looking forward to the Dacia version, mid-engine, oh. super lightweight car. Oh. Wouldn't that be great? On steelies with matte black bumpers. What a lovely idea. And old Clio seats would be brilliant. I'd kill for that. At least you could have to height adjust the seats as well. <laughs> You'd have to call it the... Oh, you had no rapid with Skoda. Dacia never had a sporting name, did they? Well, they've got the jogger. Jogger. So it could Sprinter. be... You, you can't have a runner... No, Sprinter's a van. Yeah. So it'd have to be the brisk jogger. That would do. Or the power walker. There you go. The Dacia power walker. I'd buy that. Yeah. I'd have that. Hey, we've gone a bit off topic. Yeah, I just want to touch base with you on the Alpine. It's a fantastic car. I'm very fond of it. And yeah, I wish it the right car for the journey all the way to Le Mans and back. Possibly not. I mean, not complaining at the free car that I was given to go to the race. I had a lovely time. But as a long-distance cruiser, it is a little bit compromised, largely because of the seats, that's it. Seats and the sound system. But if you spend a bit more money, you get a better sound system, so problem solved. Looking forward to all the other Alpines that are coming. They're electric mid-engine car, they're electric Mm. mid-battery car, what do you call it? Or they're electric sporting versions of the Renault 5, they're doing something like that, aren't they? Or is that going to be an SUV? I think so. There is a lecky Renault 5 coming and of course they're doing an SUV because why wouldn't they? Yeah, yeah. you've got to pay for the sports cars. Oh, listen, talking about sports cars, and we mentioned Lotus, you drove the real thing, didn't you? You've driven a Mira now? Yeah. I has spent some time in the Lotus Samira, and if they're listening, to the journalist who crashed it and bent it at Hethel the day before I was due to go and get it, or due to go there for a road and a track drive, thank you, because I ended up with it for four days as a result of you. (laughs) I got the phone call the night before, and I was like, oh no. I picked up the phone and went, someone's broken it, haven't they? And a voice from the other end went, yeah. Because the way they usually work is unless you've got a very grand thing planned, you go to Hethel, you have a chat with them about it, you have a walk around and then you drive a bit on the road and then do some laps of the track, fill your boots and then go home, which is enough to get a decent impression of what the car is, especially, you know, these cars were pre-prods and what have you. They were ready to go, but not quite, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It turned out that 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 wasn't the case because the one I was in was going to be broken, so I was at an event at Goodwood and hidden in a trailer was a bright yellow in mirror, which was great. It is... Really good. I know one or two reviews have gone, oh, I don't really like it. It's not quite for me. But for normal humans, it is more than adequate. Is it as good a drive as the Evora? Any of the Evoras? GT430, the 130 grand one. Yeah. Like, probably not. Probably It's definitely yeah. not as focused as that. This is the first one. Yeah. So it, it's on the softer side. There are two suspension setups. You can get two, which is soft and squidgy. I had the sport setup, which could be a bit rough. Our roads are terrible. But on a motorway, it was absolutely fine. The, the thing that got me about it was that when I got in it and I went to adjust the seat, I reached down for the lever and it wasn't there because they were electrically adjustable. Outrage. At least in the first edition car. The wing mirrors are kind of electrically adjustable. I'm sure you could do all this stuff in an Evora. You know, they had lecky seats, but they weren't 
quite as good. Yeah. And they weren't quite as smart. Similarly, the trim, there's no bits of plastic anywhere. It's all metal or leather, is it? So there's no bit of plastic covering the sill, which... Or aluminium or leather, thick, I should say. Well, thick carpet now. No! Um, there's, there's leather on the dash... There's Alcantara in the roof. It's a properly plush sports car. Man. I know you're saying no, and people are going, oh, it's too heavy, like 1,405 kilos in its lightest spec is what Lotus is parroting at the moment. Mm-hmm. You know, an F-Type's 1,600 kilos at its very lightest, and no F-Type leaves the factory at 1,600 kilos. That's got to be the four-cylinder F-Type, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, the four-cylinder F-Type with cloth seats yeah. and uh, no sound deadening at all. <laughs> it's a sports car for people who still want the Lotus, but also want to be able to get to work without being deafened, which you could, in theory, do in an Evora. Mm-hmm. But there was always just something a little bit missing with the Evora. You know, for the same money, you could have a Porsche, and for that, you could get climate control. With the Evora, it was just a twisty, sticky thing. And the sat-nav in an Evora was a sort of aftermarket hedge unit, which meant you could run your phone through it, but it wasn't as slick as the Porsche one. It was always just that step behind with the Evora. Whereas with Emira, it's got a really slick little interface, and it's a 12-inch touchscreen. You have to do some things through it. There are some controls, you know, some aircon things and, and bits like that through there. But you've got CarPlay, which in a Lotus feels like a very strange thing to say. Yeah, man. I know exactly what you mean by that. It's like, it shouldn't have this, but it does. When you're driving on the motorway, I can listen to Gareth Jones on speed very comfortably while Google Maps tells me where to go. Yeah. Again, like, seems weird, but... I've driven so many cars with it now. A car that doesn't have that kind of tech would really struggle nowadays because the first thing you do, no matter how many billions of pounds a car manufacturer will spend stuffing UX and UI into its infotainment system, it won't be as good as CarPlay. Sorry, it just won't be. All my mates like, what have you been driving? X, Y, Z. Does it have CarPlay? Yes, fine. I like it. Mm -hmm. So it's an essential bit of technology. Cars have to integrate with our uh, needs for constant media management and information update these days. I struggled a bit in the Dacia, as you will have heard, but I think it may be a user issue. But there are cars you get in where it just works, and there are cars you get yeah. in, it's like, why isn't this consistent? Why have I done that's different? Um, we should be beyond that. It should be seamless now. Yeah, but I will say, rather than saying it was very plush, it still feels like a Lotus. Yeah. You can put it in sport mode, and you can drive it like an absolute lunatic, and it still feels like a Lotus. The steering's still real sharp. The V6 is absolutely mega, as it always has been power delivery the supercharger noise not quite as supercharger whiny anymore they've kind of managed some of that out because they do want it to be a bit more grown up the steering feel is just incredible of course it is but again when you don't want it to be on a knife edge lotus all the time you just put it back into tour and it calms everything down it makes it all quiet and you can use it as a car rather than a sports car that's the commuter thing what lotus has created is created a car that I've parroted this one before, but I stand by it. People won't ask you why you didn't buy a Porsche anymore. Nicely put. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Why didn't you buy a Porsche? Well, why didn't you buy a Lotus? Here's here's my new car. It's a Lotus Evora. Yeah, but why didn't you buy a Cayman? Like now the Amira gives people that excuse because it's dynamically capable enough for everyone who wants to buy one. Yeah. Like everyone who gets in it will find, oh God, this is actually, this is really good. I am enjoying this. And if you want a super performance version, that's it's coming. Come. It's a coming. Of course it is. You know, brilliant. Four cylinder later this year, I think. I am a British car person. I am very well aware of that. But objectively, it is a far more grown up car than the Evora ever was. Glad to hear it. And the Evora ever could have dreamed of. Yeah. And it's still fun. It's still a Lotus. It's mega. Love it. Yeah, uh, big fan of everything that they're doing over there at the moment. Looking forward to the Taycan rival that they are mm. coming up with. That's going to be interesting. Well, hey, listen, while we're on the subject of Lecky cars, talking yes. about the Taycan rival, you're a DeLorean man through and through, more than me, I would say. I am indeed, did it deep, 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 deep. But I noticed that there is a, oh, I see what you did there. Thank you very much. I noticed that there is a new DeLorean in name alone which has appeared, mm. which is an electric car, which is, again, a take and rival. And it's from the people who were in charge of the DeLorean brand 
you've had dealings with them, I think, previously, haven't you? Yes. So the DeLorean Alpha 5, a name I love. I don't know enough about it to know whether it's an Alpha 5 reference from the Power Rangers series from the 90s. I really hope so, because I loved that show when I was a kid. It was a weird little robot that went, ay, 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 a lot. Yeah, so the DeLorean Motor Company has existed for a few years now, but not obviously in the original incarnation. So the way the current DeLorean Motor Company started was a, a chap called Stephen Wynn yep. was working in LA. He was a French vehicle specialist. And all of a sudden, lots of people turned up with PRV engine DeLoreans going, it's broken, can you fix it? And he got to know his customers quite well. And he got to know the cars quite well. And a very, very long story short, he ended up buying the brand, basically. The yep. name, all the spare parts that had been taken away by the receivers everything and set up in this tiny little town called Umble in Texas. Spelt humble, pronounced umble. And he became the DeLorean man. Hang on, pronounced like that, it sounds like it should be in Yorkshire. I come from Umble. Come from Umble, Umble. I do. Ah. He owned all the bits and he, he knew the community around it. He knew pretty much all the cars. People would come to him and say, do you want mine or do you not want mine? Or can you fix this? Can you fix that? And kind of tried to build a brand around it or sort of continue the brand around it. And now the modern DeLorean has come up with the Alpha 5. So I'm not sure how it'll work. I should probably drop him an email at some point if I find his email address. You say come up with because they may have released it. As far as I can tell, these pictures are only renders. There is no real car. This is a proposal. It is a come into Pebble Beach, though. Mm, that's August, so. isn't it? Well, let's that's see. That's August. They've yeah. got enough time to glue it together. They'll have a show car. What are the specs on it? 0 to 62 in 2.99 seconds. Top speed of 188 miles an hour. Of You're going to see some serious stuff at that speed. Probably inside of a prison cell. Uh, drag coefficient of 0.24 and 300 miles of range from 110 kilowatt hour battery. Which is, if I do my maths, that's not actually that good. <laughs> Um, <laughs> the spec of electric cars, I always think, is completely open to negotiation until the car turns up at the end of the factory floor because things are changing so quickly in battery and motor technology and engine management technology that no matter mm. what you announce, it's going to be different by the time you've got to allow a bit of headroom, I suppose, by the time you actually deliver it. So who knows? It might be tricky for them to achieve this now but by the time they get it to production if it ever happens if it ever happens hang uh, on I'm just going to do a little bit of maths hold, hold yeah. please caller I'm holding um, what is Alex working here he's got deep math head now hasn't he that's roughly three miles per kilowatt hour which is about right actually yeah, it's, it's three point five is average for a Clio size thing, Zoe size thing, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's not too bad. Was it someone told me three point seven per kilowatt hour is about the same as diesel? Yeah, if you charge publicly, your electricity is actually quite expensive. Yeah, so you mean it's not best in the world, three miles per kilowatt hour. But okay, we've discussed the tech in the car, you know, uh-huh. arbitrary at the moment. My reaction to the look of the car, yes, it has DeLorean styling cues of. The Venetian blinds on the rear window, gullwing doors, and to a lesser or greater extent, the wheels do come from the same number of spokes, you might say, as the DeLorean. Yeah. But the rest of it, for me, doesn't say DeLorean. It's far too rounded. I know it was Ital Design who designed yeah. this, who, of course, Gigiaro designed the DeLorean, didn't he? He did indeed. So I've got two counterpoints to this. Hmm. Quoting two people who have or currently do work for the BMW group. The first being Frank Stephenson, who, when criticised about the new Mini, as he still is, says that, well, actually, if you figure out the amount of time there was between the initial design and now, this is probably where the Mini's design would have ended up or somewhere close. There will have been iterations in the middle and those cues will have been taken and slightly jarred and slightly fiddled with. So in the case of the Mini, big round headlights, big circular, speedo, wheels at each corner. Those are things that have stayed, but it doesn't necessarily look exactly like the original Mini. So that's one argument for why this looks the way it does. I mean, I think the front end's really weird myself and it doesn't look too DeLorean-y, but there are a few facelifts in between, right? Ah, yes, in the lost days. I see what you mean. 
And then you'd speak to Domagoy, Domagoy, who is the exterior design lead at BMW, or he's the design lead at BMW. In case you hadn't noticed, his cars have come under quite a bit of fire recently for being, shall we say, distinctive to look at. Whenever one of their new motors comes out, I always parrot out an interview I did with him in 2019, because it was just after the four series coupes kind of triangular front end had been leaked yep. and the internet lost its mind outrage 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 the question was what do you reckon to the criticism of this and he went look earlier in my career when he was a head of exterior design he joined when they were launching five series and it was you know the same bland five series and then he'd have journalists saying you're launching the same car over and over again. This is incredibly boring. How dare you do that? And then he's like, now we're releasing something a bit different and the same people are losing their minds. We can't please everyone. We've got to change something. If we don't do something radical, then nothing good will happen. Yeah. So I get it that it doesn't look like a DeLorean, but if it looked exactly like a DMC-12, it would just be a pastiche of itself. Yeah. Because Wynn and Co, they own all of the DeLorean-ness, right? But if they only lent on that, they'd be literally stuck in the 80s. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But hey, Porsche have made a living out of being stuck in the 1960s, haven't they, with their 911? Well, they've made an image from it, but their yeah. biggest selling car is an SUV now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we are, back to that again. Well, yeah. the DeLorean, as I see it, they're in a difficult place because if you were to do an out and out pastiche of the DMC 12 or. Now, what was the name? Because there were plans for, there was a DMC, was it the 13 or the 14 was the saloon version? What was oh, it called? man. Do you remember? Uh, yeah, I remember it. DMC 24. 24, I that think, makes perfect sense. I think, because it was, uh, yeah, it was a saloon with gull wing doors. Yeah. There were plans for that. There were plans for a saloon. There was also plans for an earth mover, a bus, and something else. A space hovercraft. Yeah, and a space hovercraft. And then when the company was going to be saved by the British Consortium, they had plans to call it the Healy. That's right. There was an attempt to do that wasn't there there was there um, was indeed yeah it, it does happen that these names are picked up i remember ac was almost picked up as a way of reviving the smart roadster and build it in wales and brand it as an oh, ac would have been ace so, yeah. no one would have bought it but it would have been ace yeah exactly but you know healy yeah well healy english ooh, dmc american irish anglo american irish you could argue curious Healy would have been an interesting... You know, we got used to the idea, wouldn't we? But anyway, the point I was making about the saloon is, you know, they've called it the Alpha 5. They haven't called it the DMC 25 or the DMC 325. No. <laughs> you know, they have implanted their own ID in this version, the Alpha 5, in the name. Wasn't the 12 in DMC supposed to be how much it was going to cost? Oh, really? I didn't know that. 12,000 US dollars. Hang on, let me have a look. That's a good DMC question. Yeah. 12. But yeah, the 12 represented the original plan to sell it for $12,000, 50000 in today's money. There we are. I well, knew it was right. There you go. Okay, listen, I shan't keep you any longer. I know we have many other cars to talk about, but we've already talked about things for a very long time and probably should stop here now. Otherwise, I'll still be editing this show on Thursday when it's supposed to be going out. Okay. Quick, give us 30 seconds on two other interesting things uh, and uninteresting things that you've driven this week. Two interesting things. The Leon Cupra is a Seat Leon with a fast engine and it's quite fun. An uninteresting thing, uh, VW Arteon, very pretty but a bit bland. But if you like design, then that doesn't matter. And probably my favourite car of the year, the Morgan Super 3. Because uh, the old car, you're going to need some bleeping now, I'm afraid. The old car was charmingly sh**. Uh, the new car is just charming. It ace. Oh, it handles and steers and goes and stops and everything. And have you made a video about it? I haven't. Hopefully, this goes out after the embargo lifts, otherwise I'm in a world of pain. Hopefully there'll be some words on road and track. And in August, I'm heading up to Malvern in my car. And we're going to do an old versus new with three-wheeler and Super 3. And maybe a special surprise guest. Oh, will it be a Grinnell Scorpion going backwards, perhaps? No, <laughs> no, it will not. That would be interesting. Uh, no, 
So they know someone who knows someone who knows someone who has a fairly good replica of one of HFS's original runabouts. Oh, fascinating. Which is in no way road legal. So I'll have to be driving it round the Morgan factory, putting about. But yeah, so that's TBC. Yeah. But yeah, the film has been commissioned. It's going to happen. We're going to drive a full production car rather than a prototype, which is what I drove the other week. And I have been told, if they actually are doing this, I'll be so happy, but I've been told they're building a press car in purple. Oh, they must have known that you were going to be the first person to dribble on that car. I hope it's white, clean purple. Oh, it is. Everything in that car is jet washable, even the soul. You see, you getting a purple Morgan is the equivalent of me getting a Gilbert Invader in dragon's blood red with, I don't know, <laughs> an electric integrale drivetrain. I would just melt. I would dribble all over it. That would make me happy. Alex, thank you for sharing your loveliness in the car universe with me for this last 50-something minutes. Thank you for having me. Sorry I've been half asleep. I drove back from Le Mans yesterday and I'm still a bit broken. <laughs> that can happen. Well, recover in time for the next episode of On Speed. Sorry we missed an episode of the podcast last week. That's because we had some Something proper sad happened in my family and I didn't have any spare bandwidth for podcasting that week. But we will try and make up and fill up the gap for you. So from Alex Goy, it's farewell. Bye. And from me, it's bye-bye. See ya. For information on how to contact the show, see pictures, get song lyrics, follow us on Twitter, find our Facebook fan page, or to sponsor the show, go to garethjones.tv. Gareth Jones on Speed is made in London by Wizbang. Gareth Jones!